So the right answer is that the closestly related pair is the fly and the mosquito. And you can tell that because this number is the smallest number in the whole table, and it's telling us the sequence differences between flies and mosquitoes. So they're the closest relatives. Now, we can use this to draw a tree. Mosquito and fly are closest. Beetle is closest to mosquito and fly, so we could, you wouldn't have to do this, but I'm showing you how it would work, We'd say, okay, we got mosquito and fly. Now we're going to treat mosquito and fly as one unit. And we're going to ask, how close are they to beetle? That's the next one. And then we're going to treat the beetle, the mosquito, and the fly as one unit and ask, how close are they to the earwig? The earwig is the most distant. And we see, in fact, that the distance from the earwig to the fly, to the beetle, and to the mosquito, these are all the biggest numbers, and they're only different by a little bit. Now, I've drawn the tree this way, but it's important to know that you can draw trees lots of different ways. The information doesn't come from the order of the organisms along a line. The information comes from going back to the common ancestor. So we could draw this tree a different way. We could draw it this way, we st but it's got the same relationship information. Mosquito and flies are each other's closest relative, and the next closest relative is the beetle. Same on both trees. Or we could draw it this way. The names are in different orders. The branch point tips are in different orders, but the arrangement of relationships is the same across these different drawings. We can also draw trees in different ways. So this is the same kind of tree, only it's turned on its side, so that time, whoops, time is now going that way on this tree, whereas it's going that way on this tree. We also don't have to use diagonal lines. We can draw a tree using squared off lines where the distance that matters is the distance that goes back in time. These lines here are really just serving as spacers. They don't carry any time information. So all of these trees are ways of representing evolutionary history. And we can draw these trees because we can compare sequences, homologous sequences, in these different species and make inferences about the shared differences and the unique distinguishing differences. Of course this was done, uh, evolutionary biologists did this long before we had DNA sequences to work with. They would simply compare phenotypic features, but evolutionary, evolutionary analysis works better with the neutral characters that are changes in DNA sequences. Now, one last tree, just to make clear the relationship between these ideas. DNA and protein sequences reveal phylogeny better than phenotypes do. They've got more characters. The homology is unambiguous because you can only do this work when sequences are so similar that the, it's clear they're homologous and you can align them exactly. Remember, we talked about alignment in Module 1. And DNA sequences provide many neutral characters. For instance, all the positions have caused silent mutations in DNA sequences and all the many differences in non-coding sequences. So we can use DNA sequences of living organisms to infer the phylogenetic relationships between those organisms. And then we can use the phylogenetic relationships to learn about evolutionary processes by comparing phenotypes. So we use sequence differences to infer the relationship. Then we can use the relationship to understand how, phylo how phenotypes evolve. Now, so what we've done, we've inferred past sequence changes by comparing sequence differences, and we've drawn a phylogenetic tree 
We've learned how to look at trees, how that what matters is the ancestry. It's not which organism is sitting beside which organism in the strip at the top of the tree. It's following the ancestry back. And we've considered the logic behind phylogenetic analysis, how using the sequence differences to infer the relationships lets us then study evolutionary processes by thinking about the phenotypes. Now, as I said, this is the end of Module 2. Coming up next is Module 3, where we're going to start seriously thinking about genotypes and phenotypes. I hope to see you there.